anyway, that's enough about me. We should probably go ahead and get started. I'll put the microphone on me. It's been picking up, but I'll put it on me just to be sure. And uh, why don't we go ahead and begin with a word of prayer. Let us pray. Lord God, Heavenly Father, I thank you for your grace and causing me to come to holy baptism and to the knowledge of your divine word and will. I beseech you to put your Holy Spirit into my heart that I may study your word and not neglect or despise it, but mark it well that true godly fear would grow and increase in me and that in your word I may finally die a blessed death and receive eternal salvation through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. So that was the prayer for uh, the baptism of Jesus. So not this past Sunday, but but the Sunday before. But I like it a lot. And uh, I use this prayer when I teach the kids about what it means to die a blessed death. Right? When we're doing the Lord's Prayer, when we get to the end of the Lord's Prayer, we we talk about dying a blessed death. And a blessed death doesn't mean, uh, you know, dying while eating cake or something like that. Uh, you know, a blessed death means dying while still a Christian. You know, and so we ask that the Lord would continue to grant us His Holy Spirit, that we would hold His Word uh, fast in our hearts uh, until such time that we, we die a blessed death. So uh, that's what that means, and I use that prayer sometimes. Does anybody remember where we left off in Exodus? It's been uh, probably a month or so. We didn't get that far. Yeah. Yeah. Let's go to 14 just for fun. Just for fun. And for this next stretch, you know, a bunch of this comes up in the the church here, actually. Uh, Because we're going to get you know, eventually the man and the quail, the water from the rock. You know, the man and the quail, that comes up for sure in Lent. So we'll hear that on, on a Sunday before too long. Uh, the water from the rock, I think that comes up, but I think it comes up when Paul talks about it in First Corinthians. I think that comes up in Lent as well. I think I'm going to preach on it. But let's go to Exodus chapter 14. So the plague, the... the Plagues have ended. The death of the firstborn has happened. Uh, The Passover has happened. They are led out into the wilderness by the pillar of cloud and fire. The cloud went before them by day and the fire by night. Chapter 14. Then the Lord said to Moses, Tell the people of Israel to turn back and encamp in front of Pi-Hahiroth between Migdal and the sea, In front of Baal Zephon, you shall encamp facing it by the sea. For Pharaoh will say of the people of Israel, They are wandering in the land. The wilderness has shut them in. And I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and he will pursue them. And I will get glory over Pharaoh and all his host. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord. And they did so. So the Lord told Moses that they were going to go and camp by the sea, right? You know, which means uh, Pharaoh's going to see it and go, they're trapped, essentially. They've, they've got nowhere to go. I'm behind them, and the sea is in front of them. But God says, I've I got a plan here. Verse 5. When the king of Egypt was told that the people had fled, the mind of Pharaoh and his servants was changed toward the people, and they said, What is this that we have done, that we have let Israel go from serving us? So he made his chariot and took his army with him and took 600 chosen chariots and all the other chariots of Egypt with officers over all of them. And the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and he pursued the people of Israel while the people of Israel were going out defiantly. The Egyptians pursued them, all Pharaoh's horses and chariots and his horsemen and his army, and overtook them and camped at the sea by Pi-Hahiroth in front of Baal Zephon. When Pharaoh drew near, the people of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians were marching after them, and they feared greatly. 
And the people of Israel cried out to the Lord. They said to Moses, Is it because there are no graves in Egypt that you have taken away to die in the wilderness? What have you done to us in bringing us out of Egypt? Is not this what we said to you in Egypt? Leave us alone that we may serve the Egyptians. For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. Right, so they haven't even gotten out of Egypt, and it's, it's, you know, it's already starting. You know, as I read it, it makes me think of my vicarage was in San Francisco, uh, but in San Francisco, burial plots are at a high premium. You know, I, I think the, the only people now that maybe get buried in San Francisco, and I could be wrong, but I think this is mostly true, uh, are veterans, uh, because there is you know, a former army base, there is a, a veteran cemetery there in San Francisco, but a lot of people get buried in a city called Colma, uh, which is just down the peninsula from San Francisco. And what Colma is, is pretty much cemetery and a Target and a, and a beer store right next to the Target. That's where I would go. Uh, and I, was always, I would always get upset because uh, in Colma, the Target didn't give you bags. You had to bring your own bags. Uh, you know, and this was eight years ago whatever, and I remember being upset about it. But that's besides the point. But what Colma basically is, is cemeteries. You know, if you wanted to get buried, you had to go out of San Francisco and then get buried in Colma, or, or you get cremated, I guess. Right? Uh, and the Israelites here, they, they aren't even out of Egypt, and they say, is this why you're bringing us out here? You know, to, to die out here in Egypt? And this will come up later, you know, the same idea that, you know, is this, is this what your plan is, that we, we're going to come out and die? And they say, isn't this what we told you before? Just leave us here. Just leave us here in Egypt. It's better to be, you know, serving with the Egyptians than to go out with, with you, right? Uh, you know, and this isn't something that we're immune to. You know, it, it may be something that we're going to experience, you know, within the near future of, you know, uh, up to this point, we've lived a pretty good uh, and quiet life uh, as Christians and as a congregation, but that may change. You know, it became, might become more known in the community uh, that we actually believe what the Bible teaches, uh, and, and that might, you know, bring us some, you know, some trouble from time to time, and, and we're going to be tempted to say, well, wouldn't it have been better just to say nothing or to do nothing? You know, to just stay in Egypt and be known as an Egyptian than, than to go out and to suffer. You know. uh, but what's the, the hymn, uh, Let Us Ever Walk With Jesus? You guys know that one? What is that, 685? Is that what it is? Ah, I was right. It says... Uh, but uh, let us ever walk with Jesus, follow his example pure, through a world that would deceive us and sin our spirit's lure. Onward in his footsteps treading, pilgrims here our home above, full of faith and hope and love. Let us do the Father's bidding, faithful Lord, with me abide, I shall follow where you guide. Now here's the stanza uh, I'm thinking of. Let us suffer here with Jesus and with patience bear our cross. Joy will follow all our sadness. Where he is, there is no loss. Though today we sow no laughter, we shall reap celestial joy. All discomforts that annoy shall give way to mirth hereafter. Jesus, here I share your woe. Help me there your joy to know. All right. uh, it's just... Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's no way out for us. Yeah. Don't we sometimes feel that way in our lives? Yeah. Sometimes we feel like this God and there's no, no way out. Yeah. But then God leads them through or leads us through. Right. Right. Well, this is uh, Jacob when he wrestled with God, right? Uh, Jacob and Esau are going to have a meeting, right? And the last time they met was when Jacob cheated Esau, right? And he's heard how Esau has prospered. The Lord blessed Esau you know, uh, goods-wise, uh, and he hears that Esau is coming with, what, like 300 men or whatever, and so what Jacob does is he takes 
his wives and his children and his stuff and says, all right, you go across the river in front of me and you're going to be you know, basically my decoy. When Esau comes, he's going to see my wife and children first and hopefully be softened by that before he finally gets to me. You know, and meanwhile, Jacob stays back you know, what, on, the, on the west side of the river, you know, terrified, you know, probably not sleeping really well. And then here comes this guy like, hey, you want to wrestle? You know, you know, terrified out of his mind, right? And then, and then what does he do? And Luther does an excellent job of writing on this. His, his commentary on Genesis is like 3,000 pages. You know, he, he really, he lectured on Genesis all the time. And he does a really good job of diving into Jacob's mindset of uh, the suffering and the uncertainty about what's going to happen, you know, and, and God does this, you know. Uh, St. Paul would say, you know, we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing greatness belongs to God and not to us. You know, God has a way of doing this, of, of bringing us to the, you know, to the Red Sea with the Egyptians behind us and, and then bringing us through it in a way as yet unknown to us. He has a way of doing that, right? Uh, you know, who knows? You know, I think of uh, when we were in North Dakota, they ended up getting a, the one congregation I served got a new organ. Uh, that they, they started an organ fund. And uh, Earl Lundeen, who has since died, was a gentleman, he was a, he was a bachelor farmer. Um, I, I think he and his brother were both bachelor farmers. Uh, but smart guy, did well, um, you know, and, and saved a lot for, for retirement. He, I think he retired at like, you know, 55, and then he didn't, he didn't die until he was, I think, 93. Um, but very generous, um, very active in the church. Um, and I would go visit him because he was in the nursing home by the time I got there. And uh, he was already in, in declining health um, when I had gotten there. Um, and, and what ended up happening is we, we started the organ fund, and about, I don't know, three weeks later, Earl died. Um, and I had never talked to him about the organ fund. You know, um, just, you know, it was something that was brand new that we weren't, weren't sure about. Um, and he ended up dying, and had the fun we had the funeral, of course. Um, and later on uh, comes a check for a, a substantial amount of money um, for the organ. And I have no idea who told Earl, you know, this, it hadn't left the congregation. The, his executor was not part of the congregation. You know, it was, it was something very new, but somehow Earl knew about the organ fund and then set aside that provision for that, for that money. You know, how? Who knows? You know, and so they, they were really in, a, in need of an organ. It was, it was, it, it was in a bad state, um, and yet the Lord provided. Right? Uh, and it, was, and it was, makes sense that it was after his death because Earl was a very, I mean, he was a very faithful Christian man, very generous, but very private, you know, and the Lord provided. Then there are other times in our lives where, you know, we've been up against the Red Sea, I guess, and, and the Lord has, has delivered us through it in, in ways that we didn't expect. You know, so that happens. Right. So, but that's God's plan. He's like, well, you're going to go and camp in front of the Red Sea. Pharaoh's going to see it. He's going to come after you. Uh, just wait and watch what happens. But the Israelites, of course, they, uh, they kick against the goads, I guess would be the, the scriptural term. And they said, Moses, we told you to just leave us there. Moses said to the people, this is uh, chapter 14, verse 13. Moses said to the people, Fear not, stand firm, and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will work for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall never see again. The Lord will fight for you, and you have only to be silent. The Lord said to Moses, Why do you cry to me? Tell the people of Israel to go forward. Lift up your staff and stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it that the people of Israel may go through the sea on dry ground. And I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians so that they shall go in after them. And I will get glory over Pharaoh and all his hosts, his chariots and his horsemen. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord. 
when I have gotten glory over Pharaoh, his chariots, and his horsemen. Then the angel of God, who was going before the host of Israel, moved and went behind them, and the pillar of cloud moved from before them and stood behind them, coming between the host of Egypt and the host of Israel. And there was the cloud and the darkness, and it lit up the night, without one coming near the other all night. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord drove the sea back by a strong east wind all night, and it made the sea dry land, and the waters were divided. And the people of Israel went into the midst of the sea on dry ground, the waters being a wall to them on their right hand and on their left. The Egyptians pursued and went in after them into the midst of the sea, all Pharaoh's horses, his chariots, and his horsemen. And in the morning watch, the Lord in the pillar of fire and of cloud looked down on the Egyptian forces and threw the Egyptian forces into a panic, clogging their chariot wheels so that they drove heavily. And the Egyptians said, Let us flee from before Israel, for the Lord fights for them against the Egyptians. So some of them start to figure it out. right? Uh, and this is something that God does. He, he throws enemies into confusion. You know, I think of uh, Gideon, right? When they had, had their, their torches in the jars and they were supposed to smash the jars and then you know, the enemies started uh, what, killing each other and things like that. Uh, you know, God does that. He causes confusion. You know? uh, and there's a whole sermon you could preach on that because, uh, well, does anybody know what this word concordia means? This word that we see a lot in the Missouri Synod. Uh, we have Concordia Universities. We have Concordia Seminaries. You know what that means? Concordia is, is Latin. Uh, your, your cordia, uh, well, if you're going to go see a cardiac surgeon, what does that surgeon specialize in? Heart, Heart right? And con in Latin means uh, with. Uh, so... Uh, Con concordia means with, with one heart. And we use this word to describe how uh, by God, the, the work of God, the Holy Spirit, we believe and confess uh, with one heart and with one mind, that, that we believe together the, the preaching and teaching of the apostles and prophets. And this is a, a, a gift of God, a, a work of God, really. Uh, the other side is you know, discord and strife and confusion. Well, that's a bad thing. And, and here God punishes the Egyptians with, with discord, with, with strife. They, they get thrown into a panic, uh, unlike what he would desire for the Israelites, is to just go, trust, don't do anything, just trust and go. And so they go, but some of the Egyptians, they start to figure it out. They say, let's get out of here. The Lord is fighting for the Egyptians. And in your Bibles, it probably has Lord capitalized, because behind that is uh, Yahweh, is God's name. So some of the Egyptians are figuring out the God of the Israelites is different than the gods of the Egyptians. So they say, let's get out of here. But, verse 26. Then the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand over the sea, that the water may come back upon the Egyptians, upon their chariots and upon their horsemen. So Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the sea returned to its normal course when the morning appeared. And as the Egyptians fled into it, the Lord threw the Egyptians into the midst of the sea. Oh, I like that footnote. Uh, it probably says, the Hebrew says, shook off. Like, you know, got a boogie on my woogie, and I got to shake it off. Do you know that one? You don't know that one? I'll teach it to Anaya next time I see her. Then, then, then Karen will get to know it pretty well. Verse 28, the waters returned and covered the chariots and the horsemen. Of all the host of Pharaoh that had followed them into the sea, not one of them remained. But the people of Israel walked on dry ground through the sea, the waters being a wall to them on their right hand and on their left. Thus the Lord saved Israel that day from the hand of the Egyptians. And Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. 
Israel saw the great power that the Lord used against the Egyptians. So the people feared the Lord, and they believed in the Lord and in his servant Moses. But it's not going to be just the, uh, the Israelites that know this. Uh, as we're going to see, you know, the other countries around there, they're, they're going to hear about this, about what happened, and they kind of want nothing to do with the Israelites. You know, so we're going to get that when they, they get up to Edom's land, you know, Edom descendants of Esau, you know, and they say, hey, we want, to, uh, we want to walk through, we want to play through. And Edom says, no, go around, right? Uh, so they end up doing that. And uh, this continues on. You know, the other countries around here hear about this. Uh, think about uh, Rahab. Who was Rahab? Yeah, where did Rahab live? Yeah, they sent spies to where? What city? Well, they sent them into Canaan, which is the region, but what city did Rahab live in? Too bad Marta's in school, or we could dial a friend, because we, we did it in confirmation class. Yeah, Jericho, right? Which was not, you know, that, that was, well, Jericho's gone now, uh, you know. But Rahab had heard about the God of the Israelites, about what he did to the Egyptians, and she, she believed in God, right? That's why she housed them, right? Because uh, she had heard about what the God of the Israelites was doing. So this isn't, uh, it's like uh, when Paul is on trial in the end of uh, the book of Acts, and I, and I forget which, which governor it is, but he, he says something along the lines of, all this stuff about Jesus wasn't done in a corner. Everybody's heard about this stuff. And it's the same thing here, that when they go through the Red Sea and then the sea comes back and washes away Pharaoh and all his chariots and all that, all the other countries hear about this. You know? uh, so that's another reason that God does it. Is everybody hears about this. But then we get a cool song. Chapter 15. Then Moses and the people of Israel sang this song to the Lord, saying, I will sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider he has thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. This is my God, and I will praise him. My Father's God, and I will exalt him. The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. Pharaoh's chariots and his host he cast into the sea. And his chosen officers were sunk in the Red Sea. The floods covered them. They went down into the depths like a stone. Your right hand, O Lord, glorious in power, your right hand, O Lord, shatters the enemy. In the greatness of your majesty, you overthrow your adversaries. You send out your fury. It consumes them like stubble. At the blast of your nostrils, the waters piled up. The floods stood up in a heap. The deeps congealed in the heart of the sea. The enemy said, I will pursue, I will overtake, I will divide the spoil. My desire shall have its fill of them. I will draw my sword, my hand shall destroy them. You blew with your wind, the sea covered them. They sank like lead in the mighty waters. Now that phrase is going to come up in uh, the psalm on Sunday. Uh, psalm 2 is a psalm on Sunday. You know, where the kings of the world set themselves against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, uh, let us burst their bonds apart and cast their cords away from us. And he who sits in the heavens laughs, right? It says, you know, as for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill, right? That uh, this idea of the, the enemy of God's people thinks to himself, I've got them now, they're mine, I will destroy them and, and do whatever I want. But God says, go ahead and try, right? So that's what they're singing about. The enemy said, I will pursue, I will overtake. But the Lord blew with his wind, and they sank like lead in the waters. Verse 11, who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, 
awesome and glorious deeds, doing wonders. You stretched out your right hand, the earth swallowed them. You have led in your steadfast love the people whom you have redeemed. You have guided them by your strength to your holy abode. The peoples have heard, they tremble. Pangs have seized the inhabitants of Philistia. Now are the chiefs of Edom dismayed. Trembling seizes the leaders of Moab. All the inhabitants of Canaan have melted away. Terror and dread fall upon them. Because of the greatness of your arm, they are as still as a stone. Till your people, O Lord, pass by. Till the people pass by whom you have purchased. You will bring them in and plant them on your own mountain. The place, O Lord, which you have made for your abode. The sanctuary, O Lord, which your hands have established, the Lord will reign forever and ever. That's the song of Moses, and it's, it's actually in our hymnal, I think. Uh, let's see if I can find it. Maybe you've been at a church where, they, where they've sung this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, the Old Testament canticle. Mm -hmm. Yep. At 9.25 is uh, the song of Moses in Israel that we could use this sometime, you know, um, for the hymn of praise. We could use it there. Uh, we could use it as a response to the readings. There are all these different biblical canticles that we could use. But there's, you know, there's a, the way it goes is there's a refrain. I will sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider he has thrown into the sea. And then it has Exodus 15 set to a tone that we would sing just like we sing the psalm. And then you sing a couple verses, then you get the refrain, and then you sing some more verses and you get the refrain. You get the Gloria Patria at the end. We could do this sometime. Uh, well, we'll do it on Sunday. <laughs> We'll see. Sunday's the transfigure. Yeah, let's do it Sunday. <laughs> Quiet down, backseat driver. And, but there's all sorts of these that we could use. Like a, if you... Uh, yep. Yeah, if you, I mean, if you turn the page, then you've got uh, one from Deuteronomy. You get Isaiah chapter 12. You know, uh, you get... The Song of Hannah. Martin and I were talking about Hannah last night. Right? Uh, Isaiah 61. There's uh, the Song of the Three Young Men, uh, which is actually from the, the Apocrypha. Have we ever gotten into these? No, we should sometime. Oh, and then uh, 931 is also uh, the Song of the Three Young Men. The three young men are Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, right? Uh, it's from the Apocrypha is actually what this is. Uh, but then set to a tune by P.J. Grimm, who's a professor at our, at our seminary. I actually talked to Dr. Grimm not too long ago. I, I forget what I asked him. What? Pastor Stark is Starkey. Starkey. There's several of them that are. Yeah, Stephen Starkey is one of our pastors in Wisconsin, uh, retiring, I think, this year. Yep. So uh, these are just examples, but the Song of Moses is one of these that we could use that. Uh, uh, we could use that as the hymn of praise. We could use it in between the readings. We could have uh, the Sunday school choir learn the refrain, and then you know, we could go back and forth with that. You know, there's all sorts of different cool things we could do with the hymnal. But uh, this one I remember because we would do it a lot at the seminary, you know, uh, the Song of Moses and Israel, right? Because it has that wonderful phrase that, you know, I will sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider he has thrown into the sea. That's a pretty cool phrase. You know. Yeah. Yeah, I mentioned in a sermon a while back that, you know, the field of archaeology is a great asset to us as Christians. You know, uh, that more and more they, they just continue to find uh, 
we maybe wouldn't use the word evidence, I mean, uh, but you know, it's not that these archaeological finds prove that something happened, but they at very least uh, give evidence that it, it likely could have happened. You know, uh, so they find all sorts of cool stuff. All you know, because when you're you can't really prove history necessarily because we weren't there, but there's different evidence that at least says, well, this could have happened. You know, uh, for the longest time, I, I mentioned you know way back that for the longest time. Some people thought that King David didn't actually exist. That the only mention of King David is in the Bible. You know, and who wants to believe that? And tell what they find was it like a, it was an enemy nation that David defeated that in their historical record mentioned David. You know, and to mention that they were defeated and then by who is really unusual. So they must have really got trounced, you know. But then all of a sudden, all the scholars are like, yeah, David existed. And we're like, I, we could have told you that. You know, all sorts of stuff. So uh, things like that. Uh, even with like the New Testament, uh, you know, people like Caiaphas. You know, we have Caiaphas's ossuary, his bone box, right? That they would bury people, and then when their bodies decomposed, they would either shove their bones back to put somebody else in, or if they were cool, they would take their bones and put them in a nice box. And well, guess who we have? Caiaphas. You know, guess he existed. You know, things like that. So archaeology, they're just all the time finding cool stuff. So, you know, people try to make like science doesn't support the Christian faith. And it's like, well, you're misled a little bit there. So anyway, good point though. That, so they're finding like these chariots? Cool. Cool. Yeah. That's cool. That makes me think of uh, when I was a kid, I got to see the part of the Titanic. I don't know if you guys ever got to go there. There was a traveling exhibit on the Titanic. I don't know if it, it probably came to, I would guess, Des Moines, maybe Cedar Rapids, where they had like a big swimming pool with a chunk of the Titanic in it. You know, it, it had to be kept in water because if they took it out of the water, it would decompose. And maybe the chariots are like that. I don't know. That's pretty cool. Yeah, that's cool. So they sing this awesome song. Verse 19. For when the horses of Pharaoh with his chariots and his horsemen went into the sea, the Lord brought back the waters of the sea upon them. But the people of Israel walked on the dry ground in the midst of the sea. Then Miriam, the prophetess, the sister of Aaron, took a tambourine in her, ha in her hand and all the women went out after her with tambourines and dancing. And Miriam sang to them, Sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider he has thrown into the sea. Right? Super cool stuff. See, God's people, they, they often praise him in song. This is all over the Bible. Uh, and uh, Miriam's got a tambourine, so maybe we should break one out. You know, could we do that? Probably could if we wanted uh, at the seminary, they use timpanis all the time. Like when we have timpanis, big, big drums that have have pitches. They're not they're not just drum sound, but they're they're pitches. Um, and so, like when we have the divine service, somebody will play the timpani and things like that. It's pretty fun. Yeah. Anyway, verse twenty-two. So they get out. They cross through the Red Sea on dry ground, uh, and this is witnessed again and again that. You know, who is it that is causing this miracle? What is God? You know, it's not some naturalistic phenomenon, but it's understood that God is the one who's providing them to walk through Red Sea on dry ground. And then it's God who pushes the water back and consumes the Egyptians. But they get out on the other side. And verse 22, Then Moses made Israel set out from the Red Sea, and they went into the wilderness of Shur. They went three days in the wilderness and found no water. When they came to Merah, or Mara, they could not drink the water of Mara because it was bitter. Therefore, it was named Mara. Uh, and you have a footnote that probably says bitterness. Yeah. So I, I know some girls named Mara, and I don't tell them that. And the people grumbled against Moses, saying, 
what shall we drink? And he cried to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a log. And he threw it into the water, and the water became sweet. There the Lord made for them a statute and a rule, and there he tested them, saying, If you will diligently listen to the voice of the Lord your God, and do that which is right in his eyes, and give ear to his commandments, and keep all his statutes, I will put none of the diseases on you that I put on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord your healer. Then they came to Elam, where there were twelve springs of water and seventy palm trees, and they encamped there by the water. Every now and then you'll come across, there's a there's Lutheran church, it's called Elam. Right? Uh, there's, uh, in Fargo, there's an Elam Lutheran church. And they're not our kind of Lutheran, but it's still a cool name, and that's, this is where it comes from. Uh, it was an oasis. That's pretty cool. Yeah. I'm guessing that implies an abundance of water, right? Uh, here is, you know, well, like, uh, even driving between here and Fairbank, you know, there are some spots where there's not a lot of trees, but then you get up to the Littleton corner, and all of a sudden there's a bunch of trees. Why? Water. You know, and then I keep going up, keep going up, and then I hit that roundabout, but then there's farms, or if you look past the farms, a bunch of trees, water. If I go west, if I'm going out that way, you know, there's kind of farms and land and farms and land, and all of a sudden a bunch of trees, because water, right? And so that's probably what's going on here is, well, there's so much water that there's 70 palm trees in the middle of the desert, you know? Uh, you know, that's pretty cool. You know, and you can go on, on the internet and, and search for these oases where, it, where it's like uh, just desert, and all of a sudden, trees and water. <laughs> cool. So, uh, but the people were led there to this, this oasis. Right? But they get this place called Mara, and what do they do? Well, they complain again. And they grumble. You know? It's kind of like uh, you just walked through the Red Sea, and then you saw the Egyptians drown. You're fine. You know, now where's my water? <laughs> you know, uh, it's, it's kind of like that, you know. It's like, uh, I don't know, it's, you know, the like Gideon. We put him in this, uh, this play set, and he jumps around and plays with everything, and he, everything is fine for, you know, about five minutes. Then he starts crying, you know, because he's bored, because nobody's talking to him or whatever. And it's like, I just gave you this awesome thing to play in, you know. I'm bored, you know. Sort of thing. You know, they just crossed the Red Sea, and then three days later, they're back at it. Yeah. Yeah. Chapter 16. What time we got? Oh, we got we got a little bit. Now this we hear in the church here for sure. They set out from Elam, and to all the congregation of the people of Israel came to the wilderness of Sin, which is between Elam and Sinai. On the 15th day of the second month after they had departed from the land of Egypt. So we went from three days that passed to now, you know, we're in the two month range. And the whole congregation of the people of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. And the people of Israel said to them, Would that we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the meat pots and ate bread to the full. For you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. So what did they miss about Egypt? <laughs> the excellent food they had as slaves in Egypt. Whether that's true, I don't know. You know, you know it's the same thing. Uh, this story has been told many times about, like, uh, you know, for example, I was raised in, in a Lutheran school, a Missouri Synod school, and you know, I was fortunate that I had a lot of programs that were available to me. The school was big enough, but there's, there's a lot of little Lutheran schools that, that don't have some of the amenities that, that big schools would have. You know, and that's a temptation for everyone to say, well, you know, I really miss all that cool stuff I had while we were in the public school. And you miss the treasure of the gospel that we have in the Lutheran school. You know, it's kind of like... You know, looking back, 
I remember all that great food I had in Egypt, right? You know, and the same temptation is, is for us. Uh, it's, it's common when people join new churches as well, new congregations, that, you know, if they, they move to a congregation that's smaller, they, they look back at, you know, the greatness that they had before, you know, not focusing on, you know, why should you really join the church? You know, because that's where God's word is preached uh, purely, and the sacraments are administered according to God's word, right? Uh, so the people of Israel, they, they come out and they start going, oh, I remember, the, uh, I remember the good food in Egypt, the good food, right? They, they wanted to stay in Egypt for the good food. Now, in the parable of the sower, right, uh, in Luke's gospel, those that fall among the thorns uh, are those who, who start out in the faith, but then uh, the pleasures of life choke it out. That's what it says in Luke's gospel. You know, and so the, the Israelites are remembering the great food we had in Egypt. Verse 4. Then the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I am about to rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a day's portion every day, that I may test them, whether they will walk in my law or not. On the sixth day, when they prepare what they bring in, it will be twice as much as they gather daily. So Moses and Aaron said to the people of Israel, At evening you shall know that it was the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt, and in the morning you shall see the glory of the Lord, because he has heard your grumbling against the Lord. For what are we? that you grumble against us. And Moses said, When the Lord gives you in the evening meat to eat and in the morning bread to the full, because the Lord has heard your grumbling that you grumble against him, what are we? Your grumbling is not against us, but against the Lord. Then Moses said to Aaron, Say to the whole congregation of the people of Israel, Come near before the Lord, for he has heard your grumbling. And as soon as Aaron spoke to the whole congregation of the people of Israel, they looked toward the wilderness, and behold, the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. And the Lord said to Moses, I have heard the grumbling of the people of Israel. Say to them, At twilight you shall eat meat, and in the morning you shall be filled with bread. Then you shall know that I am the Lord your God. In the evening... Quail came up and covered the camp, and in the morning dew lay around the camp. And when the dew had gone up, there was on the face of the wilderness a fine flake-like thing, fine as frost on the ground. When the people of Israel saw it, they said to one another, What is it? For they did not know what it was. And Moses said to them, It is the bread that the Lord has given you to eat. For this is what the Lord has commanded. Gather of it, each one of you, as much as he can eat. You shall each take an omer according to the number of the persons that each of you has in his tent. And the people of Israel did so. They gathered, some more, some less. But when they measured it with an omer, whoever gathered much had nothing left over, and whoever gathered little had no lack. Each of them gathered as much as he could eat. And Moses said to them, Let no one leave any of it over till the morning. But they did not listen to Moses. Some left part of it till the morning, and it bred worms and stank. And Moses was angry with them. Morning by morning they gathered it, each as much as he could eat. But when the sun grew hot, it melted. Why did God uh, have them gather every day? Why not just grab her? A whole ton bunch of bread, and then just keep it for the whole week. Why do you think God did it that way? Well, yeah, I mean, there's part of that. Um, there's disciplining them to see. You know, God says we're going to do this to see if you listen to me or not. Uh, but there's also a positive aspect of it uh, in the Lord's Prayer. Yeah, why, why, why does God have us pray the what the fourth petition? Well, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. 
Chero is on the right track there. It's a daily need, it's not just food right. for your body. Right. It's to be able to Right. To, to know that what we need. Even on days Yeah. Yeah, it's about trust, I guess, and knowing that what we have is provided by God. Right? And uh, you've heard this, probably heard this before, that the, the Greek word for daily bread is uh, epiousion, is the Greek word. And it doesn't happen anywhere else in the Bible or, or I think anywhere else in even ancient Greek literature. We, we really have no idea what this word means. Uh, it's, uh, the technical term is a hapax legomenon, which means a word that happens once and then not again. And, and there's, there's a number of these in the New Testament, but the word for daily bread, we don't really know what it means. And so essentially what we can figure out is what I need today, you know, give to me today. Is, is the sense. And, and we have this going on with, with here, this manna in the wilderness, that the people grumble and God says, you know what? I'm going to provide for you. I'm going to provide for you every day. You know, uh, and so when they went out, the people who gathered you know, too much, well, they had nothing left over. But then the people who had gathered too little, well, when they went to measure it, you know, they had plenty. Right? They had exactly what they needed. Right? The Lord provided for them. That even amidst their, their grumbling, the Lord was merciful and then provided for them. And the same is true for us, right? Uh, what does it say, uh, you know, we ask in this petition that God would not look at our sins or deny our prayer because of them. You know, for we daily sin much and surely deserve nothing but punishment. You know, so we too will gladly, sincerely forgive and gladly do good to those who sin against us. You know, the things that we have, we don't you know, deserve, right? And, and this is something that the old Adam likes to build within us, the, the sense that what I have comes from my own sweat and tears and in some cases blood, right? Uh, but really what we have comes as a blessing of God, that God is the one who blessed our work, you know? Right, that, well, that's true too. Sometimes we have too much and it turns to worms. You know, and then we turn to worms. Yeah, yeah. You know, so God provides. God is the one who blesses it and provides. You know, uh, where I was going was like many of us have worked for things to have it all turn to nothing. You know, we've 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 put an effort on something, and, and in some cases for years you put in hard effort and then nothing. You know, uh, but the one who grants us success is you know, is God. You know, and He does that according to His will. You know, sometimes it's not God's will for us to have success, you know. Maybe that, that's sometimes the case, you know. But then we learn through it, right? You know? uh, and here God is merciful and provides for the children of Israel, even though they're going to grumble, you know. And uh, so here God gives them manna. Eventually, there's quail here too, but eventually they complain about the manna, right? They're like, we're tired of this bread, you know. Give us something cool to eat. And then you get the quail too, right? You know, so that God provides. Have you ever thought about how they actually did I don't know. Is that in the Bible that I don't recall. Because it just says that the Philistines came and covered the camp. Right. Yes. Later on, is it in the book of is it in the book of Numbers maybe where this happens? Yeah, but not so much about the quail. Yeah. Yeah, where is it? I'll find it sometime. But you're right, you know, when they when they made sacrifices and, and when they when we get into the Levitical laws, you know, they weren't to eat the blood because life was in in the blood, right? You know that. Well, who is that? Is that the Germans? Yeah. Yeah. 
I've heard of like blood sausages. You know, I don't know if I would, if I would do that. But uh, yeah, no, when they were, they were eat, part of their uh, Levitical laws was to not consume the blood. You know, and this comes up in the New Testament uh, in Acts chapter 15 in the Jerusalem Council when, uh, you know, the issue comes up about circumcision and uh, the advice of James uh, to the Gentile Christians was that they should, among other things, remain, you know, uh, abstain from consuming blood uh, so as to not cause offense to their Jewish, you know, the Jewish converts to Christianity. But, uh, but now, I guess if you want to eat blood, go for it. Uh, what were Martin and I talking about last night? Oh, yeah. Well, we, we did the presentation of Jesus in the temple. So 40 days after Jesus was born, as it says in Exodus, that firstborn males are presented to the Lord. You know, and they went to offer a sacrifice for Mary to, you know, a sacrifice cleansing her from her, you know, after childbirth. You know, and so we ended up talking about, you know, laws of purification. And, and Marta's like, I don't have to do that now, do I? And I was like, well, you know, when Faith and I had Gideon, the, the next Sunday we went to church and we didn't bring any turtle doves with us. You know, um, the... The ceremonial laws, and we're going to talk about this probably next week. We're going to get into some of these, some of these ceremonial laws. Like next week, we're going to get when you build an altar, God says, "Don't build it with steps, because if you go up the steps, the people watching Aaron are going to see up his his dress a little bit." You know that that the Israelites they built their altars with ramps so that there was less exposure. You know, and what 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 do we have right here? <laughs> a step. You know. Uh, you know, so we're going to talk a little bit about the ceremonial law and, and what was its purpose, and, and maybe more importantly, uh, why can we have a step? You know, things like that. Well, uh, what is the step? Is uh, I think that what's the official title? Yeah, there was another step here, wasn't yeah. you know, before my time? You know, uh, I think these the official titles may be called a grading. Uh, and, and I guess the purpose of the elevation is to, you know, delineate the chancel from the nave. You know, that the chancel is where uh, the scriptures are read, the sermon is preached, the sacrament is administered, you know, which is a step up from the nave, I guess. Uh, when I speak the absolution on Sunday, right? So when, when we're having confession and absolution, I'm standing here, you know, but then when it comes time for the absolution, I step up. Why? Yeah, that what is being spoken from the step up is spoken to us you know, in Christ's stead, from Christ. You know, that's another sign of, of why we have a step. Do we have to? No. You know, we could take the step out, I guess, if we wanted. You know, uh, Cheryl can kind of hide behind the, the stand here, but maybe we put it lower on the ground and then put like Ben in front, you know, that, that, that will be fine. You know, uh, there, there are churches that don't have the step, you know, and, and we even took out a step here, you know, that's, that's yeah, fine. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. Say, I mean, the priest, Father, Son, and Holy, I think there's some symbolism. There may be some symbolism in it. I, I'm, I guess I'm not sure about that. Maybe. So you don't know? Not that one. It's not something you learn? No, not, not like, you know, kind of we talk about this, the main distinction is this step, you know, and then if there's another step uh, in the chancel, some people might think of, be reminded of like, okay, you got the, the holy place and then you have the most holy place, you know. Um, well, we don't really make that distinction as Lutherans necessarily. And if somebody does want to, well, cool, you know, uh, but the main kind of thing is well, that, that there is a step. You know? um, some churches have a step, some churches don't. Um, you know, a more interesting thing as well is like, uh, you know, so even there's another step here, you know, in the pulpit, but at St. John's, it's up there, right? Um, the, the church that burnt down in Milwaukee a couple of years ago, Zion Lutheran, Faith and I had been there uh, not too long before it burnt down, and their, their pulpit was like way, probably twice as high as St. John's pulpit, you know? And, you know, and part of that is so that the pastor can be heard, you know. But there's, there's some symbolism there, too. Um, 
that particular one was built like a chalice. That the pulpit was way up there, and when you look at it, you go, that's a chalice. <laughs> you know, but then the, the pastor stands in the chalice. I don't know if that's maybe, you know. Um, there was another one that, uh, that Luther preached in that the, the pulpit, and then there was a covering over the pulpit, was a whale. And, and the, then the, the pastor in the pulpit looked like Jonah being swallowed by the whale. I, I don't know whose idea that was, but, but there was symbolism in that, you know. Um, there's, just, there's a lot of, of symbolism that can be good, you know, but we, of course, don't want to get too far into it. Now, how did I get to that? Oh, from the steps. They weren't supposed to build altars with steps so that you couldn't see up Aaron's robes. Uh, that's, that's why. Uh, the Canaanites, speaking back to archaeology, uh, the Canaanite altars had steps. And in fact, they, they found some of these, these pagan altars in this area. What did they all have? Steps. What did the Israelites' altars have? Ramps. Just another little interesting thing. But we are a little past time, so we should. We'll pick up here next week, and then we'll, we'll probably make it all the way into the Ten Commandments next week, probably. Uh, so why don't we end with a word of prayer? Gracious Lord God, our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity again to, to be back here in your sanctuary, uh, hearing and, and studying your word. Uh, we confess that sometimes, like the Israelites, when we are faced with the Red Sea, uh, we, we panic and, and, and we grumble, uh, not trusting in you to provide and, and lead us. And yet you in your mercy do not hold our sins against us. You do not look at them, uh, but instead you have placed them upon your Son, uh, who by his death and resurrection has won for us forgiveness and eternal life. We thank you that of your mercy you continue to provide for us. And when faced with the Red Sea, you bring us through in, in a way often that we had not yet seen before. We ask that by your Holy Spirit you would keep us in this true faith, that as we go about the works of our hands, that we would be mindful of the salvation that we have in you, and that we would be faithful witnesses in our word and deed. Bring us safely here again on Sunday to hear your word together and together receive your gifts. In your name we pray. Amen. The Howard Johnsons on... Highway 63, south, on the south end of Waterloo there. Uh, if you're going to a hotel, uh, we use this website called Priceline. Hotels right now are ridiculously cheap with the, with the coronavirus, I guess. Yeah. Well, it's owned by Wyndham, I think, now. Um, but, yeah, it's... It was really, no. Nope, uh, Dave came and then stayed there, came here, came to St. John's. And then he got us fried chicken uh, at the deli in Fairbank. And then he sat on the porch. You know, there's that kind of like that picture window on the porch. So he sat on the porch, and then we sat in the living room and had lunch together. And so it was good. Uh, he's offered a few times to come preach for me, and so it was good to, good to have him here. And uh, very different from me, uh, much smarter than me, but a very different pastoral style for me. But that's just, that's just fine. So. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm tired of you too. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I think, I think that that Sunday is one of my favorites. You know, I think the readings work together very well. Um, it's one of my favorites in the church here. I mean, there are some Sundays where the readings don't quite quite match up, uh, but this is one of the ones where, where they do, and I think it was really good. So, yeah, the, the second Sunday after Epiphany is what it was. So it was good. Well, happy 61st. Thank you. Yeah. Faith and I will be uh, 85 on our 61st, I guess. So you're a little ahead of us. Well done. 